Um, so thank you. Um, just a, a little bit of background to sort of situate this project um, with regard to other things that I'm working on. Um, so my main area of, of interest is on scientific representation. Um, and there's all this work within representation, especially recently, to, to sort of offer a pragmatic account of representation, which gives a central place to agents or users, um, their intentions and their ac actions or activities. Um, and I think that this move is correct when we're trying to, to explain scientific representation, and I really like that move. Um, but nobody spends a lot of time discussing what they mean by intention, use, action, agency, those sorts of things. So um, my research typically brings together the work on agency and um, action within the philosophy of action um, into the philosophy of science. Um, but I'm really excited about this opportunity because obviously representation is, if it's an action, it's not the only action that scientists are engaged in. Scientists have a, really, a, a ton of really important activities that they're, they're engaged in. Um, and I think one of them is experimentation. So down the road, um, I would love to get more and more into um, the literature on experimentation. So this is sort of one way to sort of angle into that, um, basically transitioning from representation um, to experimentation. Um, and there's this common, typical, prima facie dis distinction between representation and experimentation, right? Um, representation abstracts away from the world. Um, you're sort of creating some sort of artificial system which you can use in explanation, understanding, knowledge building, these sorts of things. Um, experimentation, on the other hand, goes towards the world, right? Um, you're, you're sort of getting into the world to manipulate systems um, so as to bring about data which you can analyze um, and then offer explanations, understanding, knowledge, etc. cetera. Um, so typically, they're sort of taken to, to, to sort of be methodologies that are sort of mutually exclusive, right? One goes towards the world, one goes away from the world. Um, they sort of seem to have different um, aims and different um, features. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to offer what I think is sort of an interesting and hopefully interesting um, and potentially contentious claim that some experiments have um, are representations. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more um, what I mean by that in a little bit. But the claim is that um, there is a, at least one subset of experimentations um, who have a primary representational function. Um, of course, experimentation is a really large frame of um, activity. There's a lot of things that count as experimentation. They include everything from the experiments at the LHC, um, which use simulation and have all sorts of high particle energy, uh, high particle high energy particles going around um, to simulations of evolutionary biology potentially um, to uh, economics experiments and so on. So I want to distinguish a subclass of experiments, uh, what I'm going to call archetypal educational laboratory experiments. And hopefully that's the last time I'll say that entire thing because it's a bit of a mouthful. So I'm going to say ALEs instead. And ALE sounds nice and it's a good little abbreviation. Um, so I'm going to be talking about ALEs, um, but that means um, that long phrase there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to trace out four examples of ALEs. Um, I'm going to take one from uh, a number of different scientific domains. So I'm going to look at um, biology, chemistry, physics, and economics. I'm going to take one example from each um, and show how in these fields, these experiments have an important representational function. Um, so after arguing that they are representations, I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about why they're representations. Um, since I'm interested in the topic of scientific representation. And then finally, I think that this is um, one possible way to offer some insight into the, the discussion that Maria sort of got into a little bit last, in the last talk, um, which is the relationship between representation um, and model, or excuse, excuse me, experimentation um, and models and simulations, right? Whether we should think of models and simulations as experiments um, and whether their representational nature has any bearing on that. Okay, so first off, what is an archetypal educational laboratory experiment? What is an ALE? Um, so uh, they, they contain a number of features. I think they're pretty ubiquitous. They're found in most every discipline as far as I can tell, though um, I don't want to make a too universal of a claim. Um, but they have these important features written right into the name. Um, so they're archetypal. They're, they're typical. They're common. They're used again and again. Um, I don't really have a standard for how frequently they need to be used to be archetypal. But these are the sorts of things where you could go to um, a conference of those scientists and mention this experiment, and everybody would know what you're talking about without saying much more. Right? They're sort of just really common and typical. Everybody does them in their undergraduate or their graduate educations. 
Um, their methodology is more or less fixed. They sort of occur in the same way, no matter which university you go to, they're going to have the same sort of thing. Um, as I've already in indicated, they're educational, um, so they're used in educational contexts. Um, so typically, all the examples I'm going to be drawing from are found especially in undergraduate, um, the labor laboratory component of any number of classes. Um, and they're also laboratory experiments. So they have the traditional features of experimentation. You're isolating various causal factors. You're manipulating variables, collecting and analyzing data. Um, you're doing all the sorts of things that, that experiments typically involve. OK, as I mentioned, my central claim is going to be that ALEs are scientific representations. Um, that is to say that one, or in many cases, the primary aim of the experiment is, in fact, a representational aim. Um, it's not to collect empirical data. It's not to reveal more about some phenomenon. Instead, the primary aim of these experiments, um, and in some cases a secondary or tertiary sort of aim, is to um, better understand the theory, the explanation, um, whatever sort of di discipline-specific knowledge um, is associated um, and trying to be communicated here. So what I mean is that they're being used by some um, agent as representations, right? So when, when I'm saying that they're experiments, I'm not, or the experiments are representations, I'm not making a claim that they're like substantial objects with some isomorphic relationship. Instead, I'm claiming that they're being used to better understand theory, right? And this goes along with the other pragmatic accounts of scientific representation. And I'll say a little bit more about this later on, assuming that there's time. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through these four different examples, um, one from each discipline, um, hopefully I won't botch any of the discipline um, discussions, um, but hopefully they will also be insightful. And I should note that there's sort of like a slumdog millionaire sort of thing going on here. Um, each of these experiments I either did in my own undergraduate education um, or was somehow involved in, so um, that's sort of a fun thing in the background here. Okay, so the first example um, is from biology. Um, so genetic drift, as you're probably familiar with, is an important mechanism of evolutionary change. Um, and basically, genetic drift is when you have changes in the allelic frequency of some population um, that happen for no other reason than random chance, random sampling error. Um, so you have uh, changes in um, your allelic frequency, and there's not some sort of um, you know, natural selection, sexual selection um, that's leading to this, but it's sort of a random um, chance. And so there's this really helpful analogy that was um, proposed really early on. The analogy is to a jar of marbles. You have this jar of marbles with multiple colors. Um, maybe you have two or three colors in there. And they have a certain frequency of colors. Um, and maybe there's 100 marbles. And you're going to select some subset of those marbles, say 20. Um, and then based on your selection, um, you're going to look at the frequency of your selection. And you're going to change the frequency of the whole 100 marble population. Um, and over time, you're going to keep doing this process again and again. And over time, the elite, the not the allelic frequency, um, the color frequency of the marbles is going to change, and possibly maybe even one color will be completely eliminated. Right? Um, so the same thing can happen with alleles. Um, one can go extinct. Um, one can be fixed so that it's the only allele. Um, these sorts of things can happen. OK, so this analogy actually, um, as I mentioned, got started way early on. So Theodosius Dobshansky um, points out that it um, originated with Duminen and Romoshelf, who I don't know how to say those names, um, but that it started pretty early on with the rise of population genetics and the new synthesis. Um, so it, it appeared pretty quickly after that already in textbooks, just as an analogy. Um, so at least in the 1950s, it was being used in a textbook. Um, and then by the 70s, there was um, Jamie Thomerson, um, as far as I can tell, first suggested that it be used as an experiment in educational context. Um, so writing in like sci to science education people um, suggested that it be um, an experiment. But he, in his acknowledgments, says that he did it in grad school, and he went to grad school in the 60s. So at least in the 60s, it was being, being used not just as an analogy, but was literally being done as a sort of experiment activity um, by students. Um, Okay, so nowadays the experiment is pretty standard. You've probably heard of it before. Um, I just gave you this explanation of it, um, but you've probably heard of it, possibly even done the experiment already. 
um, at some point in your life. If you just Google it, you're going to see that it's pretty much everywhere. Right? Um, the, the methodology is more or less settled. Um, typically, uh, students will do this over a few generations. They'll, they'll repeat the um, draw and change um, process over a few generations. Um, they might vary. Oftentimes, they're asked to vary the sample size or the original population size. Um, they might vary the original uh, frequency of the colors as they stand to one another. Um, but these are done so as to help students understand when genetic drift is more likely to happen. So if you have an isolated population that's small, you're more likely to get pretty, pretty rapid um, genetic drift. Um, of course, there's all sorts of weird little idiosyncrasies that arise with, with each of the presentations. So someone suggests that you use M&Ms rather than marbles. Um, and she says students get pretty excited to eat the M&Ms. So that's an added benefit. Um, but for the most part, the methodology is more or less settled. Um, and as we'll see later on, I actually think that this is a really important feature of ALEs, is that their methodology is more or less settled. Um, and I think this is going to help in revealing that they're representational. Um, but uh, right off the bat, you can sort of see that the, the representational function is pretty clear, especially since it's being drawn directly from an analogy. Right? So you have this analogy that had a representational function, and then you're just basically having students do it rather than sort of imagine it. Um, so students manipulate a system of marbles. They're collecting data. They're analyzing that data. They're changing various variables. Um, and then they're going to draw some conclusions. But their conclusions are not about the system of marbles. Their conclusions are about genetic drift, about the, um, the evolutionary power of genetic drift, right? about the ability to um, cause allelic fixation, something like that. Their conclusions are not about marbles. Their conclusions are about something else. Right? So there's a sort of representational function going on here. Um, this fact is sort of deepened by the fact that students are often sort of prepped before this experiment. They're given lectures on genetic drift. There's little notes at the beginning. There's like these little things that are written in italics most of the time um, that are um, long descriptions of what genetic drift is and how it works. Um, and then you do your experiment. right? Um, so it seems that it's quite clear that the reason that the students are doing the experiment is to better understand the theory, not to draw any conclusions about the marble system. Um, they're often also asked questions about genetic drift. So when they analyze their data, they analyze it in terms of marbles, but they draw their conclusions about genetic drift. They're, con they're drawing their conclusions about something else. So it seems like there's a clear representational function to this experiment. Okay, second example, Hooke's Law. Um, so Hooke's Law describes uh, there's a proportional relationship between the force you apply to a spring and the extension of that spring. <clears throat> so if you double the force that you're applying to a spring, the length of the spring, um, the extension of the spring is going to double, right? as this um, diagram shows. Um, one of the reasons I really love Hooke's Law is that um, it shows how strange science was in the past. Um, so Robert Hooke, when he first proposed this law, he didn't write the law down and give us an equation. He put out an anagram, um, a bunch of Latin letters that you were supposed to unscramble to figure out this fundamental law of the universe, um, which is really uh, strange. And then even more strange is that he took two years, two years to unscramble it. So he just sort of like let it sit there, hoping people would figure it out. I don't know. Really strange. Maybe, maybe Robert Hooke was just strange. Uh, but it, you can see that science has changed quite a bit. Uh, but it, uh, ultimately, he unscrambled it to utensio sic vis, um, which roughly translates to um, as the extension goes, so goes the force, right? um, showing that there's a proportional relationship between extension and force. OK, so since it was developed in the 17th century, um, it's a little bit more difficult to trace back the exact history of this experiment. Um, but it at least goes back to the early 1900s um, when there was a um, publication where C.L. Vestal uh, described a tool that he created that you could use in the classroom um, to be able to demonstrate and work through Hooke's Law. Um, in the same decade, uh, Gordon Folker included the calibration of spring balances as a, mean to study, as a means to study Hooke's Law. Um, so you also had, um, he was sort of offering this new way of going through classical mechanics um, where you um, really try to get students to work with stuff right off the bat. And so he said, well, let's calibrate spring balances and let's have them think about spring, uh, Hooke's Law. Um, and this was an, an initial part of his claim. 
Um, I think there's a number of reasons why this one is pretty popular. Again, the Slumdog Millionaire thing sort of stands. I did this one um, in my classical physics class in undergrad. Um, but I think it's pretty widely done um, uh, for, for, for similar sorts of reasons. Um, it's pretty cheap to set up. You just need some springs and some weights. Um, it's a good way to sort of teach students and have them start thinking about things like measurement and error um, and significant digits and stuff like that. Um, and it's a pretty simple experimental design. OK. So uh, the, the, once again, the methodology is more or less fixed. Students will oftentimes work with multiple springs. Um, they're going to try different forces. They're going to measure the change in, um, in extension. Um, and then they're going to compare their results with Hooke's law, what Hooke's law would predict. Um, sometimes they're calculating the k, um, the constant which describes the um, extension. Um, they're going to compare those perhaps to accepted values if there are some for the springs that they're using. There's also these interesting new cases, and I think this is actually sort of significant, um, which have the students either perform the experiment at a distance or just virtually. So they're not actually operating a spring, they're operating a virtual spring. Um, which they can then measure, collect data from, um, and use for a similar sort of purpose. So my claim is that, in fact, this experiment is also representational. Um, this one's a little bit of a harder claim, because the system that they're working on is, in fact, the exact same system that's described by Hooke's law. Um, so they're working on the same system. It's, it, it was clearer in the first case, because they're working with marbles, but drawing conclusions about living um, organisms. Here, they're working with springs and drawing conclusions about a law that describes the behavior of springs. Um, but I still think that it's, it's representational because they are not trying to um, uh, make any claims about spring systems. They're really trying to understand Hooke's law. Um, and there's two important ways that you can see this. One is the use of the virtual experiments, which um, are taken to be um, achieving the same sort of pedagogical purposes as doing it in person. Um, they're, they're manipulating a virtual system. The virtual system has nothing to do with springs, except for that it was designed and constructed to sort of let them think about Hooke's law. right? Um, so they're not actually studying springs when they're using the, vertical, the virtual system. Um, the second, and I think this is a really important feature of ALEs, is that deviations from expectations are treated as errors, right? Um, not as revealing important insights about some phenomenon. Um, so when you have a deviation, you say, oh, I did something wrong. Oh, I'm not able to um, think about what I'm trying to think about. I think this is because they're just obstructing good inferences. Um, I also think there's probably a doom quine sort of thing going on here, right? You're not going to trust the measurements of some student um, who's just started physics two weeks ago, um, rather than you know, centuries of uh, experiments that have verified Hooke's law for um, our um, you know, near-Earth sort of situations. Uh, but all the same, I think that there's this other important feature that when you have a deviation, the assumption is, oh, this experiment went wrong. Why did it go wrong? Well, because it's not allowing the students to come to the better understanding of theory that the instructors um, clearly are after. <coughs> okay, next one is from economics. And this is the one that I didn't actually do as a student, but I did participate in an experiment as a um, participant. Um, uh, which did, did some stuff with some common pool resource problems. OK. Um, so common pool resources, as you are probably familiar, many of you are probably familiar. Um, for example, fisheries are not owned in individual by any particular individual. Um, but there's potential economic gain from people going and using them. Um, and in some cases, you have the tragedy of the commons, where economic forces make it such that it's likely that um, the sort of public uh, property will be depleted. Um, or um, sort of run out uh, if there's not policy or regulation put in place. Um, so a good example of this, common example used, is the collapse of the North Atlantic cod fishery in the 1990s. Um, so you had this really great um, large amount of cod, and there was a lot of fishing going on, and suddenly there was overfishing, um, and the population had a huge drop um, in the 70s, and then it sort of recovered a little bit, and then there was just complete collapse um, in the 90s following that. OK, um, so this one, I haven't found as much evidence that they are um, sort of archetypal in the same way. It doesn't have quite as long of a history. 
um, as the other examples. Uh, but there are cases of economics professors writing about these in, in educational sort of um, fashions, um, proposing that this be something that econom economists should take up in their classes. The idea being that students will better learn about um, economics, especially about common pool resource problems, if they participate in a game of this sort. Um, so students are typically asked to imagine that they're in some sort of situation where they're drawing on a CPR. Um, and so like fishing was an example, or drawing resources from a forest was another example. Um, and then depending on their choices that they make, um, there's going to be various changes which are going to occur to the CPR. Um, if you draw heavily, if all the students draw heavily from it, it might be depleted. Um, if all students draw minimally from it, um, they're going to sort of minimize their gain. Oftentimes, students are incentivized with something beyond just a grade um, to perform as, as um, economically rational as they can. So you give them some sort of candy or something at the end of it. Um, yes, OK. So there's um, two important things, I think, about this example. Um, the first is that um, more or less the same methodology is employed by economists um, exp in experimental e economics. Um, to, to come to understanding about CPRs, right? So um, individuals are incentivized to act in um, as economically rational as possible, um, or whatever their aim may be. Um, and then they put them up into this situation, and they imagine and sort of work out and simulate what's going to happen to the common pool resource um, over time, right? Um, even though it's the same sort of methodology that's going on, um, it seems to me that in the case of the educational example, um, there's a representational function. The reason that students are engaged in this is not to gather data about which they're going to draw um, further explanations or theories or understanding of um, CPRs, but instead the goal is to help them to sort of have this internal perspective on CPRs and have a better sense of how the theory around them works. This point is reinforced by the fact that the two papers that I've mentioned um, this Eisenkopf and Solcer and Murphy and Cardenas um, were each, um, they took data on their students to see if the use of these games in the classroom was successful. Um, and their measure of success was not um, whether students could offer an explanation or theory, but if students could um, better have, better understand economic theory as it already stood. Right? So the clear aim in introducing these games was not to gather data to analyze and publish, but rather to, um, uh, to put them in a position to be able to better understand economics. Um, so the aim when doing this game is sort of representative, once again. The aim is to better understand theory, not um, what's right in front of them. OK, last example is from chemistry, um, the nature of chirality. So um, chemistry is really sort of an interesting field, I think, um, for a lot of reasons. But one of them is that the experiments that students do in chemistry um, tend to have this particular sort of feature where they're sort of technology, techne, skills directed, right? So a lot of the experiments are really designed um, not for these sort of representational theory reasons, as I've argued is the case for other disciplines, but rather to help students learn s specific techniques that are really important. Um, and so I think that this is the case for most cases with chemistry, and I think this is also the case with the example I'm about to show you, but I still think there's a representational function to this example that I'm going to show you. I don't think it's primary, though. Um, so the claim here is that there's a, there can be representational functions even if they're not primary. Okay, so uh, carvone is a common chemical which exists as two enantiomers, um, and an, an antiomer is... Um, a molecule that has the exact same uh, chemical structure, uh, but it's non-superimposable. So uh, they're basically mirror images of one another, like your left and right hands. Um, and as you can see here, carbone in both of its forms, R minus and S plus, um, exists as sort of a mirror image of one another. Um, so uh, they are exactly the same for every physical measurement, melting point, um, uh, you know, uh, chromatography, these sorts of things. Uh, they have one difference, it, that's in the polarimetry. That's the direction in which they rotate light. Um, so the positive one rotates it positively, the negative one rotates it negatively. Uh, but there's another important feature of carbone, is that 
they smell differently. Um, so carvone uh, S minus, or excuse me, S plus is in caraway seeds, which I didn't know what they smelled like until I did this experiment. So don't worry if you don't know what that smells like. Um, but R minus carvone is present in spearmint. And I can tell you that they smell pretty different. It's not like they're like close, where you're like, oh, that's sort of minty. They smell quite different. Um, and the only difference between these chemicals is their chirality. OK, so we didn't actually know this until the 1970s. Um, we had suspicions, uh, but we finally confirmed this in the 1970s with two publications that came out in Science, um, where they showed that carvone smells differently in these cases. And very quickly after that, um, it was already proposed that this might be a good um, mal uh, chemical to use excuse me, in organic chemistry. So organic chemistry labs um, often have students doing a number of things. One of those, or two of those, are vacuum distillations and gas chromatographies. These are important techniques that um, organic chemists use all the time. And organic chemistry labs often have students use these techniques, especially in isolating some chemical, um, some essential oil, typically. And before this, there was a number of different oils that were used. Um, but after this, slowly and surely, um, carvone has become, by far and away, um, the most frequently used one in both of its forms. Um, and I think that that's for a few reasons. One, once again, it's pretty readily available. Caraway seeds um, and spearmint um, are pretty easy to get. Um, but also because it has this interesting chira chiral feature um, to carvone. OK, so uh, methodology, you're going to isolate them. They come along with limonene, which apparently um, is carcinogenic to male rats, adult male rats, I just learned. Um, in one of its chiral forms. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, but but um, they have them separate them. They either use gas chromatography because they have differential um, rates of um, whatever being hung back in the chromatography, um, or they have different boiling points. So you can boil off the um, limonene and then leave behind um, your carvone in either of its forms. Um, OK. So typically, then, students have to confirm the purity of what's, what they've left behind, their sample. Um, and they do this by determining its boiling point, gas chromatography, these sorts of things. They also take polarimetry data. Um, and either they're going to be typically isolating both versions of it, or they're comparing their results uh, with someone who isolated the other and antiomer. So if they have the positive one, they look at the one who had um, the negative one. Um, and I think that there's an important representational feature be uh, and once again, I think it's sort of secondary in this case. Um, but the important feature is that it helps students to really think about the nature of chirality. Um, if they didn't have this really interesting macroscopic feature where they smell wildly different to nearly all of the population, um, then they wouldn't have much time to, to really focus on and think about and sort of fixate on the different chiral um, features, right? Um, the fact that the polarimetry data is different would have just been sort of this passing point, which they maybe would have noted um, in a uh, chemistry report, but left it aside. But since there's these really interesting macroscopic difference, students think more about this. Um, and they're sort of uh, amazed, I was, I recall, amazed by the fact that a very simple difference, like the way that the, chem the, the chemical rotates light, um, can be responsible for um, the difference in smells. And already in this original um, suggestion of an article uh, for using it as an uh, experiment, um, they said uh, it helps them to learn more about chirality um, because it familiarizes the student with the phenomenon of optical isomerism in an unusual and dramatic way. So it seems like, once again, there's a sort of representational function. Not only are they trying to learn about um, our, these techniques, but they're also thinking about chirality and how it works. OK, so some basic conclusions about ailes. Um, ailes are representational insofar as they are often directly descended from representational objects. So I think this happens with Hooke's Law and Marbles and Genetic Drift example. Um, ailes oftentimes involve the construction and experimentation on an alternative system. Um, so even when ex experimenting on the phenomenon directly described, the ailey can still be representational. Um, Deviations from expected results are treated as failures because they get in the way of you drawing these theoretical conclusions. And then representationals, uh, representational fo functions can coexist with other non-representational functions, um, as we saw in the isolation of carbon. OK, how am I doing on time? <laughs>
Did we start late or on time? Okay. All right. I'm just going to hustle through this last little bit. If you would like me to um, linger on it more in the questions, I'd be happy to do so. Um, I think that there are two basic general features um, that are required to have a scientific representation. Um, so one is that it must be um, I, I ascribed to an inferential account of representation, a, sort of like Mauricio Suarez's, uh, where um, the uh, representational object must be used as a surrogate for drawing inferences about some other system, some target system. Um, and uh, this other feature where it must be licensed by scientific practice. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but Suarez has said that um, there's these two parts of surrogate reasoning. So one is representational force. Um, that's the capacity of a source to lead a competent and informed user to a consideration of the target. Um, so it seems that ALEs have this. Right? They've been constructed so as to have representational force. They are um, such that they allow a competent student who's been prepped, and this prepping is often a part of the ALEs, um, to be able to go um, from the experiment to the representational target. And then further, the capacity to allow for surrogate reasoning. So they're not just that they get you to consider the other from the first, uh, but they actually allow you to draw inferences about it. Right? So you're, you're making inferences about this system, and you're concluding them about this other system, right? Um, so you're, you're um, engaged in this, this system of surrogate reasoning. OK. Um, I'll move on from that. OK, licensing. Um, so this is, uh, Suarez sort of talks about this as well. He calls it um, intended representational uses. The idea being that not just anything is a scientific representation. Um, you can't just pick something and call it a representation. Um, you have to be working within the scientific community. Um, you have to be working um, with them and thinking like them. Um, so when you use a model that's been sort of licensed for certain purposes, um, you're, you're sort of working with the system. Um, so your activities are not sort of private and individualistic. Um, your um, representational actions are communal in this sense. Um, so as I've argued in a paper I'm going to present at the PSA, and it's going to be published afterwards, um, licensing includes the context in which a, a representational object was created, the application of theoretical and empirical constraints, the awareness of and management of idealizations, and a history of its reception and use. So there's these, the, these whole other series of things that are involved and important um, when thinking about how it's representational. And I think uh, ALEs are a really interesting case. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm bringing up licensing at all is because I think that ALEs are, because they're archetypal, um, their licensing is communal, right? Um, so while there were definitely individual scientists who played an important role in establishing the representational function, um, slowly over time the scientific practice has um, sort of solidified how the methodology works, and the solidification of the methodology is in part responsible for why it's representational. Right, why it can be used as a representation is because um, it has been settled in such a way. OK, as I said, I can say more about that um, in the questions if you'd like, but I do want to leave time for questions. Um, so one last thought before I, I move on to that. Um, so there's this large discussion uh, about the relationship between experimentation and models and simulations. Um, really interesting discussion. Are models experiments? Should we treat them the same? Are they epistemically different? Um, so there's some people that think that we can treat them sort of epistemically the same. There's lots of people who think that we should think about them as epistemically different. Um, I think that these are really interesting studies. Um, I don't settle this debate with my argument about ALEs, um, but I do offer reason to think that experimentation and representation are not mutually exclusive in the way that we might otherwise think. So. If you want to say that models and simulations are importantly representational, um, which you may not in some cases or in all cases, um, just in virtue of saying this, you do not therefore eliminate the possibility that models and simulations are also experimental. Um, I think that these things can be consistent with one another as the Ailey's examples shows. So in doing experimentation, you are not necessarily stopping yourself from doing representation as well. More can and said, should be said on this, but it's going to have to wait for another time um, and or the questions and comments. I'd be happy to hear any thoughts that you have. Um, thank you. <laughs>